Namaskar and warm greetings to each one of you from Delnet Developing Library Network, New Delhi, India. Distinguished invited speaker of today's Delnet annual lecture, uh, Ms. Prish Hepworth, Director of Policy and Education, Australian Library and Information Association, Australia. Dr. Heather Brown, Assistant Director, Arts Lab, Australia. Esteemed officials of Telnet, including Shri K. Jai Kumar, President Telnet, Dr. S. S. Murthy, Vice President Telnet, Dr. P. R. Goswami, Treasurer Telnet, the other GB and RSC members of Telnet, eminent librarians, HODs of departments of Library and Information Sciences, Library and Information Science professionals who have joined us from various parts of India and also from Australia and many other countries faculty members, researchers and scholars, and students of the departments of library and information science, the uh, Delnet officials at, uh, at its main head office here in Delhi, and also in its units at Bangalore, Hyderabad, and Pune, ladies and gentlemen. I, Sangeeta Call, on behalf of Delnet, extends a very hearty welcome to each one of you to today's Delnet annual lecture, which is very shortly going to be delivered by Ms. Mrs. Trish Hefford on navigating pathways, preparing the future workforce of LIS professionals. It's an indeed and proud privilege for us, firstly, to welcome our distinguished speaker. We remain much grateful to you, Trish, for uh, uh, acceding to our request, for taking out time for us, and for being there. It's a great honor and privilege for Delnet and also for the entire LIS fraternity here in India, as you have very graciously have uh, given your consent and being there with us uh, this afternoon. So thank you so very much indeed. We also take an immense pleasure in welcoming a number of our LIS professional colleagues who have joined us from Australia. I extend a very hearty welcome and special welcome to Dr. Heather Brown, a longtime associate of Delnet, who has been very, very kind in introducing us all to Mrs. Trish Hefforth, and we are much grateful uh, for her support to us. Also, welcome to many of our colleagues who have been able to be there with us online today from Australia. I have a proud privilege in uh, informing you all that Delnet has been organizing its annual lectures since the year 1998. I would like to apprise you that the past Delnet annual lectures were delivered by the international experts, including Professor Bohyun Kim, CTU and Associate Professor, University of Rhode Island Libraries in USA, Dr. Camilla Ellere, former President, American Library Association, Professor Raj Nehru, Vice Chancellor, Sri Vishkarma Skill University, Mrs. Anjana Bhatt, University Librarian, Florida Gulf Coast University in Florida, Ms. Dr. Heather Brown, Assistant Director of Paper, Books and Preventive, Arts Lab Australia from Adelaide, Professor Subrata Chakravarti, former Dean and Director, IMM Lucknow, Mr. Brian Gambles, Executive Director, Library of Birmingham Trust in Birmingham, UK, Professor Sandeep Sancheti, Vice Chancellor, Manipal University, Jaipur. Dr. Gulshan Roy, Director Journal, ICERT. Um, Mr. Brent May, President, Special Libraries Association. Dr. S. S. Mantha, uh, the reputed robotic specialist and chairman, former chairman, All India Council for Technical Education. Professor S. V. Raghwar, Network Systems Laboratory, Department of Computer Science and Engineering from IIT Chennai. Mr. Stephen Abraham, President, Special Libraries Association, USA. Professor V. S. Prasad, Director, NAC, Bangalore. They were having the former director. Professor P. M. Bhargava, the former Vice Chairman, National Knowledge Commission, Government of India. Dr. N. Vijayaditya, the former Director General, National Informatics Center. Dr. N. Sheshagadi, the founder of National Informatics Center. Professor N. Balakrishnan, Dr. R. Natarajan, Dr. V. S. Arunachalam, Professor N. G. K. Manan, and Mr. N. Vittal, who delivered the very first annual lecture of Delnet way back in the year 1998. This is just to give you an insight and glimpse into this very prestigious Delnet annual lectures. And it's a proud honor and privilege to have with us today, Mrs. Trish Hefforth, who will shortly be delivering the Delnet annual lecture. And indeed, indeed, a great honor and privilege for us. I have immense pleasure in um, introducing you all to Mrs. Trish Hefford, who is an experienced strategic leader and who has worked in private government and not-for-profit organizations across five countries. Originally a lawyer, Trish found her ways to libraries through the copyright platform uh, reforms, including leading the successful Cooking for Copyright campaign for library copyright changes. 
in libraries, Trish found her true calling and now works as a director of policy and education for the Australian Library and Information Association to support the library and information profession in Australia to ensure that all Australians have access to information, resources and culture that they need to live their lives to the fullest. In this role, Trish is responsible for overseeing the association's professional pathways initiative. The initiative marks a significant investment of the association in a diverse, supported and valued library and information workforce with the skills, knowledge and ethics needed to deliver library and information services that anticipate and meet the needs of the community now and into the future. Trish also oversees the association's training, CPT, accreditation, research and policy areas. I must confess that Trish, that with your, uh, you know, the talk that we all of us are going to listen to, you're also significantly going to contribute to the professionals in India. And you must really add that it's not only in Australia, you also have impacted the lives of our in information professionals in this country. I have an immense pleasure in welcoming you once again and now requesting you to deliver the Dillnet Annual Lecture on Navigating Pathways, Preparing the Future Workforce of LIS Professionals. May I have a pleasure in requesting you, Trish, to take the session. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Sangeetakul, and thank you very much to all of the people who have joined us today, our distinguished guests and everybody dialing in from India and from other countries. It is actually my incredible pleasure to be here today to, to be presenting to you, but more, more than presenting, to be sharing, I think, a little bit of the journey that we are going on in Australia, because one of the things that I've learned very strongly in my years of libraries is that no country has a library and information profession that is an island. Libraries and information are all about connecting people and they're about connecting knowledge. And it would be my great pleasure if some of the stuff that we have been doing would be able to be used by people across the world. I also do have to apologize that my cat loves Zoom meetings, uh, loves to, loves the library and information profession. So my cat may join us at various times, which is the issue of doing a presentation uh, reasonably late at night, Australia time to an international audience. So I hope that nobody dislikes cats. Oh, let's see why my slides won't move. Oops. To start off, I would like to acknowledge today that I am calling from the traditional lands of the Ngunnawal and the Gambari people. And in starting, I would like to pay my respects to the elders, um, past and present of the lands that I am seated on. Uh, the beautiful lands of the, of the Ngunnawal and Gambari people are lands that I was born on and I, I need to pay my respect to their elders, amongst other things, for the continuation of culture and the continuation of knowledge. Our first peoples in Australia really have been stewarding the knowledge and the culture of this country for the longest time of any continuous culture in the world, and I pay my respects. I wanted to start, I guess, with a little bit of an overview about why. Why are we looking at the profession and why are we looking at the library and information profession in particular. And I think it really comes back to that core purpose of, of well, why libraries? And I'm sure you are all are sort of very well aware of um, no, numerous developmental goals, including the sustainable development goals. And I've always found that this particular phrase from the International Federation of Library Associations, which I know that Delnet has a relationship with as we do in Alia, has always really spoken to me. And it says that economically, socially and environmentally sustainable development depends on access to information. Without that access to information, everybody from the individual to the global level is deprived of the ability to take the right decisions, deprived of the ability to innovate, deprived of the ability to participate and to benefit from the rights of science and culture. So that underpinning of the access to information powers our sustainable development and it's the core purpose of library and information systems. And we see this in the way that library and information services 
contribute to every single one of the sustainable development goals. And these are goals that Australia takes very seriously. And indeed, we will be publishing, uh, hopefully next week, our latest baseline um, update on our progress to achieve the sustainable development goals. And one of those uh, things that we look to do in fulfilling the sustainable development goals is actually to share practice and to share knowledge across countries. So I like to I like to think today that my being here with Delnet and hopefully hearing from you and taking questions and having a conversation after this presentation, in doing that, we are actually fulfilling progress towards those sustainable development goals. So another way to look at this is that libraries are actually critical infrastructure. They sustain our progress towards the sustainable development goals. They are a key uh, organisation for education from, from young children through to adults. In Australia, we do a lot of education for people who may not be within a formal system. So they may be people who have come to Australia uh, past school years but need education around, say, English language or culture. They may be older people who went through their school years a long time ago and they need support with digital skills or new ways of accessing information. They support our students as they go through schools and universities and vocational or technical education. They support our researchers so that we can actually build on our research and develop new products. They support our companies. They support our lawyers and our judges and our doctors and our nurses. Basically, without libraries and without the ability to provide that access to information, to knowledge and to culture, the country wouldn't work in the way that it does. And so libraries are critical societal infrastructure. And libraries don't exist without people. So I've said there are no libraries without librarians. And when I use the word librarian, there is some flexibility in that word to acknowledge that that role can sometimes be fulfilled by people who don't hold the exact qualifications, but who do understand how libraries work, who understand the knowledge and the values and the ethos, who know how to contribute their skills or fit into a, a part within a wider segment. Whatever the exact role they are, those librarians are critical to making those libraries work. We can have all of the information stored in the server. We can have all the books stored in the room, but without a library staff that is able to develop a collection, to maintain a collection, and most importantly, provide access to that collection, we don't have a library. We just have inaccessible information. And so if we want to make sure that we are improving library services, and we want to make sure that our library services are able to move with communities and deliver services into the future. The place that we need to put the most attention is to the people. And so that's where the Professional Pathways Project in Australia comes in. And the, the project aim of Professional Pathways is to ensure that we have a diverse and valued library and information service workforce that is equipped with the right skills and the right knowledge and the right ethics and the right support that they can deliver quality um, library and information services that anticipate and meet the needs of the population. To sort of give you a little bit of maybe some of the Australian context for where this progr program sits, compared to India, we have quite a small library sector we have about 450 university and TAFE libraries spread across the country, about nine and a half thousand school libraries, and they can be large for large schools, which in Australia is up to maybe 1,500, maximum 2,000 students, down to um, part-time libraries that might run in small schools of only 20 or 30 people. We have about a bit over 1,500 public library service points, and that's everything from public libraries to mobile libraries or even book vending machines where you can go and get a book out of, a, out of the machine by typing in a code. We have about 
2,000 special libraries. So those are the libraries that sit within law firms or sit within hospitals, sit within companies or research institutes. And we have nine national, state or territory libraries. So um, the National Library of Australia, for example, or the State Library of New South Wales. And these are sort of key cultural institutions with large historical collections as well as um, borrowing collections. We have about 9.3 million registered public library members, other of population about 27 million people. So almost a third of the country, well, over a third of the country is a member of a public library. We service almost all of the school children in Australia, the vet students, so that's our vocational or technical training. We have around 7 million visits to national and state libraries, and that includes through our online platform. And we look after about 1.6 million students and staff in the university sector. So for a country of the size of Australia, it is quite a large footprint across the world spectrum. We're talking about reasonably small numbers and underpinning all of that, we think we have about 25,000 people who work within the library and information services in Australia. So, that's sort of the context. And as I said, the, the project that we have um, gone into, we've called Professional Pathways. And it is really looking at how do we get a diverse and skilled, knowledgeable, supported, valued library and information workforce. This is just sort of a little bit of a project plan so that I can talk through where we're up to and where we still have to go. So we've just concluded the first year of a four year project and that stage is really the discovery phase and I'll talk about that in a little bit more detail on the next slide. From here we are actually moving into the development stage where we will be looking to develop a new framework that will support career long development for our library and information professionals and also look at new entry pathways for people entering into the profession. We're looking at implementing that through our membership scheme and with our new tra with new training products that we will be developing with our partners into year three of the project. And by year four, well, by the end of year four, we're hoping that we have a new sort of professional framework for Australian library and information professionals that builds from what we have already, but enhances it and opens it up to more opportunity. So the work that I really want to talk through today comes from this initial discovery phase. And what I'll be talking through really is the, what we have found through these discovery phases and then so you can see where we're leading off to. It's been an incredibly long discovery phase that has started, uh, well, we said November 2019, but realistically started even before that, where we really started to look at education in Australia. Now, we, Australia has some of the world's best library and information courses at both that higher education or university level and also at our vocational or technical level. But like in many other countries, we are facing definite challenges within that higher education sphere. And in Australia in particular, we have had some real cost pressures on the higher education sector that have caused the number of our courses to close. So when looking at this whole situation, we are aware that there have been some diminishing of options for students, but also that it's really important for us that we are able to support those courses because those courses are the um, single largest way that we get new people coming into the library profession with the skills and the knowledge that they need. And they also support our Australian specific research in the library and information sector. So starting off with a view for education, we actually then moved through to have a look at, well, maybe the question is not so much about just the education piece, because what we were really beginning to discover was the question was more around, well, what are those skills and knowledge that people need? How do we get the right people into the library and information services? And how do we then make sure that those people can pick up the right skills and knowledge that they need. And so from that, the project shifted to what we've now called professional pathways, which has its core focus 
on the knowledge, skills and ethics needed for um, su success within the library and information profession. So we've done a whole series of consultations on that and we brought on Dr. Gillian Hallam, who is one of Australia's best researchers in this area, to, to come on board. And through those consultations and a huge literature, which um, Jill undertook a huge literature and environmental scan to produce the Professional Pathways Technical Report. Uh, to, which, and this underpins the whole Professional Pathways Framework project. So the Professional Pathways Framework Project technical report is available should anybody wish to go and have a look and the web address is sitting there at the bottom of this slide or if you just go to the ALIA webpage, you should be able to find it. It's, it's 319 pages, so I warn you it's not a light read, but it is absolutely fascinating and thorough look at what around the world have been considered to be the core skills knowledge, ethics um, and competencies for the library and information sector. Technical report has about, draws on more than 800 sources and it incorporates more than 600 consultations from people at various stages from the beginning of the uh, education thing right through to people providing comments on the draft technical report. The technical report really explored five key areas. It looked to the specific knowledge and skills required by library and information professionals. It looked to the values and ethics that underpin professional practice. It looked at what the current qualification pathways in Australia into the profession were. And then it looked at, well, what, what does the, the future hold? What are the role of micro-credentials or other new products or other new pathways. And then it had a look at the value of continuing professional development and, and how might that tie in with professional recognition. When we came to having a look at the uh, skills and knowledge frameworks, we found that there was a huge variety of, um, of frameworks out there some of, and I've just put up two very different approaches. So SILIP, as you probably know, is the Library and Information Professional Body in the UK. And you can see that they have a beautifully designed graphic that looks at their, um, what they call their PKSB, so which is their professional knowledge and skills base. And it sort of splits it up with ethics and values in the middle, professional experience and generic skills, and then the specific different areas uh, around them in segments with overarching things of professional development, organisational and environmental context, and wider library data information and knowledge sector context. In Australia, um, by contrast at the moment, we have a number of foundational documents, some of which just pertain to the Library and Information Service, uh, and some of which we do jointly with other bodies. So for the key points I've put up there come from our joint statement on, on foundational knowledge with the Australian Society of Archivists and the Records and Information Management Professionals Australasia. And so what we have done in that document is actually just identify the six key domains of practice. And each one of those domains has subcategories and key bits of knowledge and skill that are meant to be used. And they're just two examples of ways that went through. We pulled together a huge variety of um, frameworks and I really recommend going and having a look at the technical report. And as well as discovering that there were a lot of commonalities between the different subject matter that was covered, we also discovered that there was a lot of difference in how people were approaching things. Uh, whether people were just taking broad domains that could be applied at different levels, so from technical level through to master's level. Some people were ranking it with different levels that should be expected at, um, as you progressed through different levels of professionalism. We had frameworks that tried to cover the field for all library and information services, whereas we had other um, frameworks that 
honed in on some of those specialised areas, so public libraries or special libraries or health libraries. And even within those, there was a huge variety of approaches. So some would start off with a comprehensive framework of all of the skills and knowledge that you would need within a specialised sector, say research libraries or health libraries, or others would leapfrog almost or build on existing frameworks. So they'd have the, the generic framework they'd refer to over there. And then they'd say, but for this specialised one, here are the additional skills and knowledge. I could, I am aware that I only have 45 minutes to talk today, so I'm not going to pull up all of the different ones. Please do go and have a look at the technical report. The overarching piece when we got to the end though, was we looked at it and said, we can pull together some key broad domains that people agree on. We also recognise that what this has really shown is that the library and information um, service is not homogenous. And the biggest piece of feedback we got about the whole report was that people were blown away by the diversity of the library and information profession. That people who may be experiencing one or two or even three different library and information services were still amazed at how wide the library and information services really were. And the related uh, fields of, say, archives and records management. The other thing that we really found was the place where everybody was in agreement. Well, no, pretty much everybody was in agreement was that the core value and the core ethics and the core purpose of library and information services was the thing that united us. So when I started off the talk saying, well, why am I doing this? Why am I passionate about it? It's because we need libraries and the purpose of libraries is around that freedom of access to information, that equitable access to information. That is also what binds us together as a library and information profession. And when we looked into the nature of professions, that's very much what we found too. So the values and ethics of a profession represent an intrinsic element of professional identity. And so we found that as individuals from even from outside areas, so in Australia we have, for example, people who might originally be IT people who come in and support like research libraries around data management or, or become systems librarians. We have people coming in with a social work background to support the work of public libraries or support the work of school libraries. And we discovered that as those professionals come in and they become immersed in the, in the library and information professional culture, through their exposure to the value, skill and ethics, they too have become really keen to be recognised as library and information professionals, not in that they have the complete range of knowledge and skills, but in that they hold true to that core ethical purpose and values. And I think we see that core of ethics and value reflected in the way that the public perceives it. Uh, this is a quote from Nick Paul from Sillip, and it says, library and information professionals are trustworthy because their work is founded on the strong ethos, ethics and values of librarians. And it's not just me giving a marketing spiel about how wonderful libraries are. Every time we poll or somebody polls around trustworthiness, librarians are up there at the top. This is a recent Ipsos poll from the UK, and you can see that Librarians are second only to nurses on the trustworthy factor and beat out other key professions like doctors and teachers and museum curators. And I'm not saying it's a competition, but actually maybe it is a little bit of a competition and we are doing really well. And the reason that we're doing well is because we're trustworthy and the reason that we are trustworthy is because of that core value and ethics. So, that sort of looked at the frameworks and that solid ethics. The next thing we really looked at in that report is, well, what, where are our future skills going? So now that we've collated all of our frameworks together and we've 
looked at that core thing of knowledge and ethics, well, what comes next? And we, we know that libraries are, grow and they change and they have grown and changed throughout all of time. And I'm sure many people on this call today will remember times when the libraries that they worked in over a number of years or the libraries that they went to as undergraduates at university or as children have rapidly changed. As the needs of the community change, so when new services are required, the libraries change as well. In Australia, that has meant things like um, allowing wife, providing free Wi-Fi and charging points. It has meant uh, moving to almost entirely electronic journal subscriptions and electronic monographs for the university sector. It has meant doing rapid research reviews within a health library sector because both the technology and the ability to deliver services have grown, but also the needs of the community have changed. And sometimes there are changes that nobody anticipates. So COVID turned up, for example, and you know, I'm sure as you found in India and we found in Australia, changed many things that we thought we knew overnight. But from change, there are great opportunities. So to use quite a simple example from in Australia, when COVID hit, one of the first things that happened is that our public library system had to close its doors and people could not attend in person. And from that, we started, we worked with the publishers and the authors in Australia to start up a scheme called Online Storytime so that we could deliver story time remotely uh, on, over the internet. And from that, we've had some great benefits. So we've been able to, for example, deliver bilingual story times to audiences that would never be able to have heard them before. We've done Auslan story time. So Auslan is the Australian form of sign language. And we've been able to deliver those to people who wouldn't be able to have come and really heard with it heard a story time before but they can hear it with the Auslan signing. We've been able to deliver story times to people who couldn't come into libraries because they lived too remotely or they didn't have transport access. And it's a very simple example but it's an example of the fact that when you have the right skills and the right knowledge and you are in touch with your community so you know what the community needs are, you can respond and that's what we're looking to with future skills. So from our consultations, we found a number of emerging skill sets that um, had been identified as key areas of focus going forwards for the library and information services. And we, we tossed up a lot about what we should call these, whether we should call them future skills. And the reason that we were a little bit hesitant was that a number of these skills were not new. These are skills that the Library and Information Services have been dealing with for a number of years, but they are skills that are still in a constant state of change and a constant state of needing to be upskilled or potentially skills that need a change of focus. So for example, uh, media literacy, which is sort of a subset in some ways of information literacy. Uh, with In Australia, I know from our example, and I, I know from uh, reading and talking to some of my colleagues in India as well, also in India, the rise of COVID saw a huge increase in the rise of mis- and disinformation and the, the different networks through which that mis- and dis disinformation travels is a constantly changing feast. And so trying to keep up both with that as professionals, but also the changing needs of the community in this area is an area of emerging skill sets. One that um, comes across a lot in Australia in particular is cultural competencies. Now, cultural competencies really refers to the ability of professionals to understand the needs of diverse populations um, and to respect cultural differences, and also to address disparity amongst different cultural groups. In Australia, there's a particular need around cultural competency for our First Nations people. And a lot of that is dealing with the legacy of colonial collections, where we've actually embedded structures of colonialism um, into our collection management and into our collection development, 
and into the way that we store the information in the way that people can access and retrieve that information, as well as not being as aware as we need to about ways to make libraries culturally safe people, places for the people, who, for First Nations people who work and First Nations people who use the services. So um, for us, we can identify that this is an area of emerging skills. And so it, it flags to us a need to make sure that these are the areas that we are addressing strongly in our pathways into the profession, but also recognising that these are areas that are going to need continual professional development as well. The other thing that really came up for um, cult when we looked at these emerging areas of practice is that we came back to ethics and values again. So when we were looking at, say, information literacy or media literacy and fake news, it came back to those, those ethics and values around being a trusted source of information about allowing people to access the information also by educating. So we, for example, are working with the University of Canberra at the moment on a new short course or a micro credential on media literacy that I'll talk about because that we know that we need to be able to support the people to come in in our educative role so that they have the skills around media literacy. When we looked at um, our cultural competency in our First Nations, there are a huge amount of ethical issues around access to information, around putting barriers to First Nations people accessing information, even in simple things like using uh, descriptors that are not authentic to First Nations people and might actually hide records away. So we have a huge range of emerging skills, but at the same time, they are still anchored very much in that knowledge and ethics that we started off with and in those underlying areas of, of assessing community need, of information literacy. So we're seeing, yes, it's a fast changing world, but after 309 pages and two years of research, coming back to the fact that that core still is serving us really well, but we need to both be able to articulate it better and be able to make sure that we're helping people as these new areas come up. So that sort of leads us to, to this slide here. Um, and if, I, if you can indulge me to read it out, it says, if we accept that library programs and services are becoming increasingly diverse, then it's critical that we also consider the knowledge and skill sets and the staffing profile required to deliver contemporary library and information services. If we want to attract talented and committed individuals, we must ask whether the current qualification pathways into the library and information sector are still the, the correct ones. And this is sort of where we have ended up at the end of the, the professional pathway thing when we look at qualifications. And we can absolutely, well, we need our existing course pathways to come in for a number of our professionals. But it's really obvious too that we need to bring new skill sets in or um, increase the way to bring in skill sets from people who have data management, who have IT, who have ability to do data analysis and, and um, who have education backgrounds in different ways. But when those people come in, we need a way for them to be able to adopt the library and information ethos and the core bits of that library and information um, systems and the knowledge of how the libraries work and how they work within a wider uh, universal concept. So how do we tie in with library services across the world? And in this area, there are a lot of really exciting developments. So we have a huge range of, of new products on the market. MOOCs have been around forever and ever, I know. But during COVID, we saw a huge amount of development for MOOCs. Uh, again, the fact that I'm here today talks to the ability for us to be able to have cross-cultural and international dialogues with different countries and shared knowledge work through um, as we as we are looking at micro credentials and short courses there's a huge amount of potential 
uh, to be able to address those needs within the workforce for quick upskilling. So one of the key barriers we're finding in Australia is that uh, people who can only study part-time might take four years to complete a master course or five years to complete a master course. And we're finding that there's not the ability to do a quick upskill in media literacy or a quick upskill in cultural competencies for the people who are there and need them. And then finally, we, we looked at, at um, continuing professional development and coming back to that, well, what does it mean to be a professional? And we really looked at the role of two, two different, well, three different groups. One is the employer to support their employees to be the strongest and the best people that they could. So what, what support and what value placed on continuing professional development and pro is needed from an employer? We looked at the role of the professional associations in supporting professionals in their lifelong learning. And we also looked at the role of professionals to take control of their own lifelong learning uh, and recognise that one thing that we will be doing in this next development stage is really looking at, well, what trigger points from an association perspective can we put in to make sure that continuing professional development and contributions are recognised. Is that through a different form of recognition process? Is it a way through registration or a revalidation of professional status? I'm not quite sure to be honest, but what I do know is that we very strongly want our professionals to be active. And that means that they have to be living their ethics and values every day. They need to be sure about why they're there in the purpose and be applying those ethics and values when they're presented with unique situations or new areas. They need to be lifelong learners. So that continual professional development, whether it's be um, through MOOCs or through communities of practice or through joining special interest groups, or by undertaking new projects or professional reading or being an active research and researcher or a practitioner researcher, those are really important. And the other part to being an active professional is the giving back to the profession. So it's the, the volunteering for committees, the joining communities of practice, the sharing of knowledge. And so in this next stage, where we've got to with our frameworks project is looking at creating a whole of career framework that where so that Alia can support our professionals to identify their lifelong learning needs or identify a pathway into the profession and then to be able to identify what sort of route they need to go. Do they need to go and do a graduate diploma? Do they need to go and do a certificate three? Do they need to um, do a graduate certificate for library and information services and supplement it with some, with some service to the profession and some micro credentials? And so that's where we're hoping to end up. And I'd really love to share that all with you at a later date when we've actually got it finalised, which will hopefully be in May. So, the future is bright. We have a fantastic opportunities ahead of us with, with um, new products, new solutions, and we also have huge new challenges. And every time there's new challenges, well, every time there's been challenges to the library and information services, librarians have risen to that challenge. And I see no reason why that would change. I think, you know, as I said, we've done this huge review and at the end of it, really reassuringly, the bedrock is solid. So we have new challenges and we have new technologies that are coming up. Our community needs will change. That's not new. Technologies have always changed. Communities have always changed. But that key bedrock of skills and knowledge and values and ethics and a commitment to lifelong learning that is supported by employers and supported by the professional association, I think is what will see us through, uh, no matter what sort of fake news and myth and disinformation get thrown at us. So I have cheerfully hit my time, so I will round up there. I hope that was a little bit interesting for everybody. As I said, 
the, the key detail and all the wealth of knowledge is in the technical report and in the overview report. They're openly licensed, so please use them, share them, uh, find them on the website, or you can find me on Twitter or send me an email and we're very happy to pass them through. Uh, and Sangeeta, I think I am now done if you wanted to do questions. Thank you very much indeed, Trish, for delivering uh, one of the most highly inspiring, illuminating uh, Delhi Annual Lecture. It was highly incredible. And thank you so much for uh, making it possible for each one of us to uh, fill our pots of learning with your huge expertise that you hold on the subject. Indeed, much grateful to you. Indeed, much grateful to you. And we must congratulate you and all the entire team who has uh, worked on this Professional Pathways Framework uh, document, a 309, quite an impressive one. And I think all of us would definitely be wanting to refer to it. And because there would be a lot many takeaways, you know, from this, the work that we could see that uh, more than uh, a large number of libraries, consultants who have worked together for this. And uh, it, it, it was really so wonderful to get not much of uh, many insights from this uh, yeah, from your talk and right from uh, even to know about the trustworthiness of the library professionals not many of us were aware about this veracity index uh, that you have shared that we we are better off in uh, even in comparison with the medical doctors what we usually feel that they are the ones so we are at number two uh, and we do look forward that we should be able to achieve to number one as the most trustworthy professionals uh, at a global level um, and uh, one of the uh, the main highlights that we were able to see and that speaks volumes of your commitment and passion for this profession and that it has all been uh, centered around the core uh, values and ethics which are really very very important and uh, also yet another point you know which has been uh, the the main highlights that we uh, feel you know to carry the right skills you know and that's i think a great message that you have conveyed uh, through this uh, Short presentation of yours that to carry the right skills, the right knowledge, the right support system, you know, has to be there in place. But yes, uh, the major, most important thing for a professional to carry the right values and ethics and ethos, which I think we must uh, swear uh, and see to it that uh, uh, the technology, a lot many competencies, you know, can come, they can acquire that. But these ethics and values has to be something which has to be an intrinsic values of a library professional that you have highlighted. Indeed, indeed, much grateful to you for bringing it to the attention of the some of the aspects that we as a professional uh, should always uh, try to look at. Also, one of the things that you have also de uh, spoken about that is, uh, you know, uh, why we are uh, we, we are into the libraries, why professionals are there, and what is the role of these professionals? It's not just simply building collections, uh, but for connections, for providing an access to information, that to an equitable access, the universal access to information, you need to have the your our own uh, workforce in place. Uh, so that's again yet another important thing that we should always have to remind our own selves as a professional we have to remind our own selves that just simply building collections would not help we have to be there you know in establishing connections and providing that access to information and one more thing which i'm able to see a very close relation uh, uh, even in the indian context and that is you have spoken about this cultural competency you have taken the example of an Australian in Australia, but yes, it really holds good also in a country like India, wherein we have to be very much sensitive about it and we have to build up that competency, the cultural competency, as we have to cater to the needs and requirements of our user community from across, from diverse cultural backgrounds, and we must really acquire that. These are some of the very basic, the human uh, ethics, the human uh, values that we have to have in place uh, in addition to a lot many things. And even you have spoken about this, um, uh, the commitments uh, from the employer, uh, uh, the continuing professional development, CPDs, and how as an employers. Well before, so Trish, once again, uh, we express our, uh, uh, you know, uh, 
a warm gratitude to you for sharing so much of knowledge with each one of us, your huge expertise with each one of us. And quickly, before we make the uh, floor open for questions, with your such a huge experience that you have with you, can you just tell us what are the three major challenges that you um, encounter? You know, and when we're talking about more at a global level uh, for uh, the policymakers, uh, for those who are being, uh, you know, uh, they're supposed to take the profession forward and to uh, make the things work. What are the three major challenges that you find? Um, what are the gap areas that you find which are not really making it possible to do to the extent that we should be doing it uh, for upscaling uh, you know the skill sets of our library professionals we are talking more at a global level what are the major uh, if uh, if i just ask you what are the three major challenges that you encounter uh, as you have been you know instrumental in doing a lot much of work so what are the three major challenges according to you uh, uh, which are uh, which we have to really overcome those kind of barriers or uh, uh, in, in your viewpoint. I would just like to uh, know from you before we make the things open for attendees. Thanks, thank you, uh, Dr. Kel. Do you mean, sorry, just to check, do you mean the three major challenges for, uh, for library professionals in skills or the three major challenges facing libraries? The skills? Yeah, so I think I, I think that uh, they they come. I think that they're, they're probably universal. I think that across the entire world, a lot of library and information professionals, the the desire to do continual learning does not necessarily match the resources that are available to do uh, learning. And by that, I don't just mean the, you know, being able to afford a course or being able to afford a training. It's time, more than anything else, it's trying to find time to do something. And I, I and it's one reason that I am so uh, keen to talk to people about uh, reflective learning as part of their everyday workflows as well. And so for, you know, for us, and I'm sure for many people, our continuing professional development really does have a reflective practice base to it. So, and what we try to say to people is, if you have to learn a new system at work or you are part of a webinar or you're putting together a project, all of that is a learning experience if you take a time to reflect on it. And then increasing and, and coming through that too is that ability to share knowledge. And I do think that on the whole, library and information professionals are better at sharing than almost any other professional. And it's, not, it's one of the things that gives us superpowers. Uh, but, that, but again, putting that reflective practice in so that when you are sharing, then also coming back and reflecting about what you've learned from other people. Certainly after I finish um, today, I, I will be putting in my CPD log with my reflections about what I've learned from doing this presentation. So I think resourcing and definitely time is one. I think there's always the, the trouble that there are too many things to learn and it's hard to prioritise sometimes. And I think there too, learning from other people um, is important and always trying to keep your eye on, when in doubt, it's judging what your community needs will direct you as to where the most important thing. Your community might not need you to be up to speed on the terminology around artificial intelligence. They might need you to be much better at programming or they might need you to know what's happening in scholarly uh, publications around open access. And if that's what your community needs, that's one sort of guidance to where you should direct your um, attention. And then I guess the other real challenge, um, I think, for, for professional development is being able to make other people recognise its value. So I think sometimes, uh, and I think some of it is we're a victim of our own success. My librarians do amazing things with very limited resources sometimes. And the trouble with doing that and producing the result is sometimes it's undervalued. So one of those professional development is actually the ability to sell what you've learned and and what you need to learn so that it is actually valued and recognized 
thank you so much, Trish, for further, further adding, you know, to uh, our knowledge and indeed much grateful to you. Now, with your permission, uh, we would uh, like to quickly take the questions. And this is a request to all our attendees, uh, keeping in view also the time zone difference that we have. It's right now around uh, uh, 9.30 to in Canberra. And uh, so just wanting to request all our attendees, please be brief. We are going to have the QA for yet another 10 minutes time and uh, requesting you all, please raise your digital hand. If you want to quickly ask your question, introduce yourself and ask your question. We are alphabetically going from A to Z and uh, because of paucity of time, we may not be come back for the second round. So please ensure uh, that your question to be short and crispy and and uh, ask and get uh, the best uh, benefit of, uh, uh, you know, having our distinguished speaker, uh, Mrs. Trish Hamford, who is there with us and ask your question. I'm firstly going to Mr. Abdul uh, Jasim C, who may like to ask a question and has raised a hand. Mr. Abdul Jasim C, could you please unmute yourself and ask the question? Because of paucity, I would just say once, and if you're not able to do that, I'm compelled to move to the second attendee. Mr. Abdul Jasim C, uh, I have unmuted you. Please unmute yourself. I think Abdul, you are not able to do that. Going to our next uh, attendee, Mr. Abhishek Kumar, who is wanting to ask a question. Mr. Abhishek Kumar, could you please unmute yourself and ask the question, Abhishek? Atrish, I request you, uh, uh, you know, to be there because uh, this does happen in the online uh, because of the technical. Uh, Glitches at times, they're not able to do that. Uh, Mr. Abhishek Kumar, in case if you're encountering any issues in getting connected, you can post your question quickly in the chat box and we will be happy to take the question. Mr. Batappa P, Mr. Batappa MP, uh, could you please unmute yourself? Mr. Batappa MB, yes, we are co uh, connected right now, Mr. Batappa. Yes, madam. Good evening, madam. Um, Madam, current qualification pathway uh, in, in in India, PhD is required for librarian. But how is the scenario in Australia? Hello, Madam. Yes. Can I get my question? Uh, Trish, uh, current, Mr. Qualifications. current qualifications. He is wanting to compare. Like in India, we have the masters and we have got a PhD in library science. He is wanting. Mr. Batapa is wanting to know the scenario in Australia. Uh, what are the kind of degrees which are being, uh, uh, you know, imparted uh, or the education which has been imparted for library and information science? So we have um, at the moment we have sort of. Um, three professional sort of recognition things. One is for people who are not librarians and just uh, have a professional status somewhere else who work in libraries, and that's our allied field professional category. Then we have our library technician professional category, and they are people who have a diploma at the vocational level, uh, so a, a technical sort of um, level. And then at our university level, to, to be sort of a, a librarian, so our associate membership of ALIA, we accept people with a graduate diploma in library and information science or a master's degree in library and information. And you can, of course, go on to do a PhD as well. And we have a number of fantastic librarians who have done that. Very much, Trish. Quickly moving now to Dr. Ravikant Gupta. Dr. Ravikant Gupta, I have unmuted you. Please unmute yourself and ask a question. Dr. Ravi Khan Gupta, this is for you. If you want to ask the question, you have raised your digital hand, please unmute yourself. I'm sorry, Dr. Gupta, uh, uh, you may perhaps uh, write an email uh, to Trish and uh, mm -hmm. should be happy to because of paucity of time, we have to really rush and see uh, that we are, there are, I, I believe, Few questions have been posted in the chat box. I'll just quickly would like to take them and uh, uh, we are just uh, moving now. This is from Mr. Singha that we don't have any audio device issues. Mamta Rani, uh, I'm uh, Mamta Rani. Could you please unmute yourself if you want to ask the question? Mamta Rani, yes, Mamta, we are connected. Mamta, we are connected. Could you please unmute yourself? Let me 
we just want to make the best use of your, uh, the ability of our speakers time. So just can't afford to wait from our attendees. Mr. N. Suresh, Mr. N. Suresh, could you please unmute yourself? Mr. N. Suresh. Suresh, uh, we may have to, you're not able to do, we have Naka Masiha. Mr. Naka Masiha, your talk has definitely generated a lot much of, uh, you know, uh, they're wanting to ask you many questions. Mr. Naka Masiha, Mr. Naka Masiha, I believe, you know, I think it's rather better that we, uh, Mr. Naveen Kumar Ji, Mr. Naveen Kumar Ji, Mr. Naveen Kumar, Mr. Naveen Kumar, just quickly moving and Mr. Pallav Kumar Bhamek, there is no audio device, so I'm sorry, I can't really give you an audio control. Uh, Rajan Babu TK, Mr. Rajan Babu TK, could you please unmute yourself? Mr. Rajan Babu TK, could you please unmute yourself? Trisha, just request you to be there for yet another two, three minutes. Not more than that. We are towards the closure of the. Uh, yeah, and so uh, just trying to. We have uh, Shangita Jha. Shangita Jha, could you please unmute yourself if you, if you may like to ask a question? Shangita Jha, could you please unmute yourself? I request our attendees, please uh, click on to this digital hand only if you are wanting to ask a question. Sukrita Saraf, uh, Sukrita Saraf, could you please unmute yourself? Sukrita Saraf, could you please unmute yourself? This is for Suman Day. Mr. Suman Day, could you please unmute yourself, Mr. Suman Day? I believe they are not able to unmute themselves. And Mr. Swami Nakala, Mr. Swami Nakala, Mr. Swami Nakala, would you like to unmute yourself? Let me, Trish, just ask you one last question, which is being posted in the chat box. And uh, we have Trinath M. Mr. Trinath M, uh, would you like to unmute yourself? Mr. Trinath M. Yes, we are connected, Mr. Srinath. Good evening, ma'am. The thing is, yes. the question is, is it better to work with the college or school? In point of education, we should. Is it better to work with the? College or school? No, as you mean to say, school. as a library professional? Yes, ma'am, as a library professional. See, if... Uh, uh, Mr. Srinath, uh, Trish, would you like to say something? Because uh, he's wanting to know, is it better to work with a school as a school librarian or as a college librarian? College in the sense that uh, like engineering uh, college. Yeah, look, I, I think it really depends on, on where your passion lies. So if, and, and you know, if you, because people people go into this for different reasons, and because all of this is about access, which group of people do you want to support? You know, is it school students and and their teachers, or is it college students and and the researchers? And if you know you've got a particular interest in a in a certain area, so you know, um, if it's open scholarship or if it's early literacy or it's supporting reading, then knowing that will tell you where your best place to go is. Oh, thank you, Trish. Thank you very much. Mr. Vijay Patidar, uh, would you like to ask a question? Mr. Vijay Patidar, please unmute yourself as quickly as you can. Mr. Vijay Patidar, I'm, uh, I would be just taking, and this is for Mr. Kor Koradur. Mr. Yelepa Koradur, if you have uh, want to ask any question, Mr. Yelepa Koradur, let me quickly, this is the last question for you, which is coming in, and that is, uh, uh, which has been uh, posted in the chat box. I am uh, have to just see, because there are a couple of questions which are there. Uh, 
Okay, uh, Trish, there is one question which uh, some of our two librarians are basically wanting to know that whether there are any academic libraries in Australia which uh, at times also work for the public, that is they make it open for the public also, the academic libraries, or is it only meant uh, because there are some cases now coming up even in a country like India, within the college uh, libraries, their infrastructures, you know, they are, you know, it's getting opened for the general masses. Do we have any such examples existing there in Australia? So for um, the university collections that are, you know, academic journals and things like that, there's generally a limit to a set community. Um, you know, the, the large academic publishers are generally quite tight about who you can make those resources available to. But um, other resources from academic libraries are quite often open to the public. So uh, in particular, a lot of our libraries have substantial special collections or archival collections, and they are often open to um, researchers outside of their university or the public to come and have a look at. We also have in Australia a couple of uh, joint use libraries that are public and school libraries together. So especially in regional and remote areas, instead of the school having a library and there being a public library, they are sometimes combined to have one school and public library in the same building and with the same collection. In fact, there are a couple of questions. This is for our attendees and because of paucity of time, uh, we would be very happy to forward your questions uh, to Trish and uh, because there are a number of questions that we can see they're being uh, splashed on the screens uh, on the chat box, but uh, because of time paucity, but uh, you know, next time we are certainly going to again, uh, would be uh, requesting Trish to give some time to us so that we can have more exhaustive deliberations. Uh, Trish, thank you so very much on behalf of Delnet and on behalf of each one of us it has been a proud privilege for us thank you so much for sharing in a very short span of one hour time you have been able to deliberate on a number of things lot many takeaways uh, and on which i think each one of us here in, in india would like to uh, look into that further in order to enhance uh, and also to see that we uh, are able to create a roadmap for the LIS professionals in this country. Uh, thank you so much for sharing your immense expertise on this subject. And on behalf of Delnet, we would like to present and we would be sending it across to you by email. Uh, this is a token of our warm appreciation and admiration uh, for all your time and efforts in being there with us, but uh, not only with Delnet, but yes, with the entire LIS professionals from India. We are presenting it to you with our great sense of our gratitude to you for your time and efforts in being there with us today. And you will indeed soon be receiving it. Yeah, and we Thank really you. look Thank forward. You very much. We really look forward to the normal times wherein we can invite you along with uh, Dr. Heather to India and to host you here at Delnet. We really look forward uh, to the days. So thank you very much, Trish, once again. It has been a great honor and pleasure for us to have you here. And thank you very much. In spite of being so busy, you have been able to accommodate and accede to our request for which we remain ever grateful to you. Thank you very much for being there. And we would also like to thank uh, Dr. Heather Brown uh, from Australia and our colleagues from Australia who have been able to join, apart from our own library and information science professionals who have really made the session more lively with their lively interactions. So thank you very much, one and all. It was indeed a great honor and pleasure for organizing, for Delnet, for organizing our Delnet and a lecture, which was so splendidly being uh, delivered by Mrs. Trish Hemford, Director of Policy and Education, Australian Library and Information Association from Canberra. Thank you very much, Trish, once again. And uh, it's, it's uh, with great admiration for you. And we really look forward to having you back again in the future uh, webinars. We would, we would like to engage in an Indo-Australian dialogue on revamping the LIS education. And we would certainly be approaching you yet again. So thank you very much thank indeed. You. Thank, you. thank you. Thank you, Trish. Thank, thank you so you. very much. Yeah. Thank you very thank much. You. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much and thank you one and all. It was indeed a proud privilege for Delta to have organized the Delta no lecture. Thank you very much, Trish. God bless. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Uh -huh.